guests this morning uh, for the Science of Cal lecture series. I see familiar faces here, some of whom have been here long enough that you remember being back in this room um, uh, a little over a year ago. We're going to be in here, I think, for all of this year. Actually, we even have this room in February, which we haven't done in previous years. Um, this is now, I think, the seventh year we've been doing this. We started as an astronomy series, um, and we're now kind of covering science across campus um, under the auspices of Science at Cal, Rachel Winhill. Here, you can raise your hand, Rachel and Katie Birchie at the back there um, are the coordinators of Science at Cal here on campus. Um, Katie designed the awesome t-shirts that some of you bought uh, uh, that I was hawking last month. We raised, I, I think, kind of seven or eight hundred dollars from that. Thank you so much for your support. And for those of you as well who uh, donated to Science at Cal, um, at either sort of towards the end of the year or at other times during the year, we really appreciate that. But most of all, we just appreciate you being here in the audience um, and, and keep, keeping on coming to support these lectures and the other things that Science at Cal has going on. If you want to stay informed about other events, uh, including the East Bay Science Cafe and other lecture series, which uh, Katie and Rachel are involved in coordinating, uh, that takes place off campus once a month. What's the next lecture in, in February, Katie? Uh, Um, so if you want to find out who that's going to be, then you need to sign up either for our mailing list or follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook um, or check out our webpage, a number of ways to keep in touch. If you Google Science Account, you should find us. Um, so yeah, we're going to be in here. Uh, we've moved over from Malta Hall. Um, so uh, this is where we're going to be for the rest of the year, except April, um, which is the Cal Day open house when there's going to be all sorts of things going on on campus on the 3rd. Saturday and April, but otherwise please keep on coming back here um, for uh, the third Saturday of each month. Anything else that I forgot, Rachel? I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna print some more t-shirts at some point. And we sell. Are. I don't know. We the apologies to Jan, Elaine, and the rest of you who uh, got your t-shirts that month. If, you know, you did get an exclusive, it's kind of like Kickstarter in some ways, you know, you, you pay up front and you get exclusive access to these. They'll become a little bit more common kind of down, down, down the line as we print a few more of them. But for now, you can wear your, your uh, Katie Boche design Science of Cal t-shirts with prize, with pride. Um, first run. First run, yeah, limited edition. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce to you uh, Nadav Sarek. Uh, Nadav did his undergraduate and uh, PhD in Tel Aviv University uh, in Israel. And uh, he's been out at Berkeley now for five years, working at the Energy Biosciences Institute, um, uh, just just off campus here, but run um, it's a UC Berkeley uh, run institute. Uh, a lot of what they're doing there is really kind of trying to understand um, the DNA and trying to understand, particularly biofuels. There's really an emphasis on how we can find the next generation of fuels that's really going to kind of wean us off fossil fuels, be more sustainable. And uh, Nadav is going to tell us this morning about that and how. Uh, DNA sequencing is also kind of another side of that biofuels coin. So thank you very much for that. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, and, and I really want to thank for this opportunity. Um, as Scott mentioned, I did my PhD in Israel on plant biology. And in a way, I am actually a plant biologist, a plant molecular biologist. Uh, five years ago, I moved to join the Energy Bioscience Institution. Uh, where we explore all different types of alternative energy. And today's talk, uh, it's going to start a little bit awkward, because I'm going to talk about two things that on first sight doesn't seem to be that related to each other. I'm going to talk to you, and, and in this talk, I'm going to try to explain some basics. Um, obviously, not get going to get into the details. Um, I hope you'll understand that some basics in molecular biology. Uh, how do we see today? Biology, how do we do research today in biology? It's very different uh, from what we did in the 80s and in the 70s. Uh, they like to say that the 19th century was the physics, the 20th century was chemistry, and the 21th century is going to be all about biology. Uh, I hope I'll be able to explain to you why. And the second part, I'm suddenly going to move into talking about energy. Where do we get our energy, uh, which you all know? 
Uh, but what do we mean when we say alternative energy? And it might seem like uh, two completely separate things, kind of like water and oil, literally, right? Water and oil. Uh, and we like to say that water and oil don't really mix. But it's not true. Oil and water can mix. Uh, and I really encourage you to do it at home. Take a glass, put water and oil. And it's a little bit tricky, but slowly add soap. And what soap will do is completely will soak the water into the oil, or the, the oil into the water, right? That's what soap is all about. It's actually a molecule that can bind oil on one hand and water on the other hand. Uh, that's how we get our uh, dirt out of our hands. So I hope that in the beginning it's going to look like water and oil, and in the last part I hope to add some soap and mix these two together and explain to you how with the tools that we have today, um, for example, DNA sequencing, how we can actually contribute to a different aspect like bioenergy. Because today when we talk about DNA sequencing, you probably related, you probably think about biomedical and some health issues. But it's, it can contribute to some other aspects as well in our life. So let's start to talk about a little bit, uh, some very basics in molecular biology. And what really changed in the past 20, 30 years is that from looking on a whole organism, either it people, humanity, animals, or plants, we start looking on cellular level. We have more and more technology to look on cellular levels. These are human cells, these are plant cells. And we can start to ask questions on a cellular level. What happened within the cell and how changes within the cell will eventually reflect back to, to change the uh, whole organism. Organism, the human or the plant or uh, whatever animal organism that we're talking about. So when we talk about the cell, there are some similarities between human cells and plant cells. Uh, to them, I, as a plant biologist, I am going to focus on the plants part. Um, this is a general scheme of a cell. Again, there are some, the basics are actually very similar between human and plant. The cell is surrounded by a membrane. A membrane is basically a, a bunch of fat. And if you think about it, a fat will just cause a barrier that you can store things with inside, kind of like a balloon, right? So. Um, both plants and humans have a plasma membrane that's surrounding the cells and actually create the barrier of the cell. Plants, unlike humans, have a cell wall, which is a very thick layer surrounding the cells, and it's going to be very important for our second part. It's going to make sense again in the second part. Unlike humans, plants have chloroplasts. Chloroplasts are uh, these organelles. Organelles are actually a small room within this building that can be very specific for some purpose. So chloroplast is where photosynthesis occurs. Photosynthesis is the conversion of light energy into chemical energy, meaning sugar. So that will happen in the chloroplast. Plants, unlike animals, has this vacuole, which is a huge, kind of like a storage room. And it's pretty cool because this storage room can actually store some very toxic material. And for example, how does lemon is so sour? Because they actually, the plants store all of the acid within this vacuole, right? So the cells itself can actually still function and can still protect the seeds within the lemon. But when we taste it, we actually break this component and we release all of the acids. And that's why lemons are so um, acidic or sour for our taste. Um, still, there is some basics uh, that are very similar between uh, human and plants. And for example, it's the nucleus. The nucleus is where we store the genetic information. That's where we store the DNA. The DNA is our genetic information. So let's focus at the beginning on what does it mean genetic information. So we're talking about the nucleus. In the nucleus, there is a genome. And first of all, about just to uh, talk about the genome size. Because in general, we have a feeling well, first of all, we have a feeling that we must be better than all other organisms. If that's true or not, uh, I don't know. I, in some aspects, we definitely do. Uh, but there's also the basic concept of being is better, right? And we're talking about brain size. And it's kind of true for genome, but not completely. If we're looking on genome size, so here are on the top, you have all the fungi and bacteria, uh, which are very simple organisms. And it's true that they have smaller size, and the genome size slowly increase until we get into this area where we have birds, humans, and plants. And you
you see that there's still some variability. Some plants will have much bigger genome than humans, for example. For example, the oak genome is almost four times bigger than the human genome. Still trying to talk to an oak tree, it's going to be very challenging. <laughs> but, so there is a level of complexity in the genome size. So next what I want to do is to explain to you what do we mean when we say genetic information, what do we mean actually when we say the genome. With, again, within the nucleus, we have these big, huge molecules that call chromosomes. And chromosomes are huge molecules containing the DNA. DNA are just super packed within this molecule that call a chromosome. And to try to explain to you how much pack is it, if you take the human genome and just stretch it into a straight line, it's going to be the length of one meter. So something like that. Right? And we condensed it into something that is actually more close to one micrometer. So we condensed this DNA, this genomic material, into something very, very fast. But what do we mean when we say DNA? How do we store information in DNA? So DNA is composed out of four molecules. And we can think about them as four different letters. And what DNA does is within the DNA, there are regions that we call gene. And a gene is a piece of DNA that will be translated into a protein. And a protein is something that can actually function, can, that can do something very specific. For example, it can uh, clear a molecule. It can bind a molecule. It can change a molecule. Uh, if you want to think about something relatively intuitive, uh, homoglobulin is a protein that can bind oxygen. That's how we transfer oxygen within our body. We have a protein that binds the oxygens within, the, within our blood and then just transfer it. Right? So we have a DNA, which is, again, the, basically just a molecule composed out of letters. And we know how to translate these letters into, first of all, we actually copy it to a molecule called RNA. You probably heard about it. I'm not going to talk about it today. Uh, but if you want to think about it, think that the DNA is like this huge book. And you want to translate the paragraph into something um, very practical. So what we first do, we copy part of it, like we first copy the paragraph. And I guess it's intuitive, the advantage, you can make a lot of copies, right? If you need something a lot of time, first you make a lot of copies. And then out of this copy, you actually translate it to something you really want to do, which is a protein. And I'm going to give you examples for that. So again, to show you how, and all my examples are real life examples, uh, this is how a DNA sequence will look like. We have four letters, A, T, C, and G. And we know that the DNA is being read by three letters. Every three letter will, will translate into an amino acid. So we can take this DNA sequence and we can translate it into amino acids. This is methionine, glutamate, serine, and four. We have 22 amino acids. And these amino acids will eventually will fold and create a 3 d structure of a protein. And again, the protein will be the one doing the specific job that it needs to do. Um, we have roughly 25,000 genes that can encode roughly 25,000 proteins. There is some, some variability. Um, and again, there is a variability about the number of genes between different organisms. So now trying to explain it to you even more, here is a DNA sequence. This is a gene. That's how we look on a DNA sequence. We again, we have these four letters. And we know that we can translate it going three by three, right, into an amino acid. So we can take this DNA sequence and we can translate it into amino acids. And if we do that, each letter now represents an amino acid. For example, methionine, this is an amino acid. All right? So now we have a linear line of amino acids. These amino acids can fold, and the gene I showed you, this is a gene from the photosynthetic mechanism. This is the protein from this photosynthetic mechanism. And when it will fold up, we'll eventually get this protein. This is a crystal structure of the protein that represented has a, you know, in a structure way another amino acids. All of them, it's actually a complex of multiple proteins, but part of it is this protein, and according by this gene, right? And now we have actually a protein. And this protein, what this protein does, it's actually harvesting the light. So we know now which amino acids are important, how exactly
exactly do they get the electrons from their light and they will eventually translate it into energy. Right? What this protein does, it can harvest the light from the energy and create a chemical energy. Right? Something that we can store. It's not happening actually by this protein. There is a series of proteins, but what it starts here and in the end, we'll get sugar, we'll get glucose. And glucose is a cell molecule that plants and us can store. Right? So we have it in our body and then whenever we need energy, we can use the glucose as a source for energy. So now that we understand um, how DNA is being translated into information, um, we can also try to understand some of the stuff that happened in agriculture. For example, and I'll get into it, but today uh, we have really great capability of sequencing DNA and get more and more information from plants. And what we did is we sequenced the genome of wheat, we sequenced the genome of corn, we sequenced the genome of rice, we sequenced the genome of, I think, more than 50 plants. And we can also se sequence the ANC system and ask what have changed. Now, for example, I'm going to give you one of the most famous examples. What changed, what really changed in agriculture over the years? Well, a lot of things changed, but one of them, the change from 10,000 years ago, um, where agriculture started roughly, human planted plants, and in many aspects, in many crops, what you really want to eat is the seeds. And it's kind of like a problem, because you're growing a plant, and what the plants want to do, once the seeds are ready, is actually get rid of them. These are the offspring, they want to release them to the environment, so the next generation will grow in different places. But you want to keep the seeds. Right? You want to actually use the seeds for food. So what human found is this very nice variety that actually doesn't release the seeds. Today, if you think about it, when we buy corn, when we buy wheat, the seeds are actually stay attached to the plant. The plant doesn't release them. Which is, again, not necessarily what the natural plants we would like to do. So now we can sequence the genome of the wheat that we use today, we can sequence the ancestor of the wheat, and we can ask, well, how does this change happen? What exactly, we know the phenomena, we know what happened, now we try to ask the question, how exactly does it happen? And the truth is that we actually found the gene that encodes a protein, and what the protein does, it's actually kind of like, a, uh, kind of like acting like a scissors, releasing the seeds from the plant. And the variety that, the, that people found, again, roughly 10,000 years ago, was actually a mutation in this gene that made the protein to be non-functional. If the protein is non-functional, then the seeds are not being released from the plant. And that's something that we can really benefit from. Right? Because now you grow the plants and the seeds stay, and it's much easier to harvest and collect the seeds. So we now can understand what happened during evolution of agriculture, or when agriculture was developed. Now another thing that I want uh, to make sure that we understand is that what I explained was actually on a very a simple way. But in a way that the real, I guess, the right approach to look at uh, genome information is that today organism is like this huge complicated building that has all kinds of different rooms. And what happened is that if you think about it, in each of these rooms, there's this huge book with information about the entire building, and that's the DNA. And a big part of it, if you're either up here or down here, you need to dig and find the relevant information for your room, right? If you're in a conference room from the top, you don't really care about the elevator. So a big research or a big part of the research that we're doing today is to understand how from this huge book, the rooms actually find the relevant information within the DNA and being translated. They don't really, although they have it, they don't necessarily use it. Okay, so now as I promised, a huge swoop. And now we're gonna, we, we are, I hope that we manage to understand some basics of uh, molecular biology uh, and genetic information. I'm gonna jump to something completely different, talking about energy, and, but don't worry, the last part of my talk uh, is going to be trying to combine these two. Uh, and I, I will say right now that I'm going to try to leave uh, as much time as possible for questions, and I will be available after the talk and in emails if you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. <coughs> All right, so now let's 
switching to energy. And the first thing I want to start you with is a relatively complicated slide, but I'll try to make, uh, to, um, to explain the basics. And the basic is that here we have the source for the current energy that we use. For example, uh, solar, natural gas, coal, biomass, and petroleum. And this is the end use. And what you can see is that today, this slide was done, uh, this research was done in 2008. It didn't change that dramatically. Basically, natural gas, coal, and oil are responsible for almost 90% of our energy demand. And especially for transportation, we use only petroleum. All right, so this is what we use today. And a very important thing, I, I think that's one of my most important slides in this talk, is to understand the scale of what we are using today. So just about oil, the world consumes one cubic mile of oil per year. Right? So every year, this is the Eiffel Tower, this is just to show you, this is the base of Eiffel Tower, and this is the truck. This is how much oil we use every year. Right? So when we are looking for solutions, and the next step will be trying to explain why do we actually need alternatives. But we always need to remember that this is the scale that we want to either replace or change. And that's very important to remember. What basically that means that there's enough room for any possible solution. Okay, so, so we know the sources for energy, natural gas, um, coal, oil, uh, and some other stuff. And you want to ask, why do we really need an alternative energy? Why do we need to replace? Why do we want to replace? And you can think about many different reasons. I want to discuss this very briefly to discuss the these three reasons that usually are more popular than the others. And the first one is that we're running out of fossil fuel. Right? Um, fossil fuel, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that you all know the first part I'm going to say, not necessarily the second part. Fossil fuel was there, were created long, long time ago where the plants were actually got rotten and converted into oil. But what happened in evolution is that fungi appeared. And when fungi appeared, they started eating the, the rotten plants, the biomass. So actually, once fungi appeared in evolution, oil production just stopped. Right? So all the oil we use today is that oil that was done, uh, was created when plants were just getting rotten in the, in the soil before fungi appeared on earth. Right? Today, fungi just eat all the leftovers. So you can say, okay, we're running, uh, eventually we're going to run out of fossil fuel. Uh, there is uh, some amount of oil in the ground that eventually we're going to pump everything. The second part is energy independence and um, economic in a way. The U.S. spent today $1 billion per day uh, on exporting or importing sorry, oil. Today it's a little bit less because of the new um, uh, fracking system, but it's still we spend a lot of money on buying oil. Um, and we do want to be energy independent. And the third thing is climate change. Um, we are aware that there is serious evidence that climate change is happening. Part of it is because of our current use of energy and maybe we want to uh, address this problem. So I'm going to start with, are we running out of fossil fuel? And again, it's a little bit complicated slide. I'm going to try to explain it. But the basic point that you want to uh, realize is that so far, we used only 10% of the oil that is in the ground. And to make it even worse, it's 10% for what we have been discovered and we, using new techniques, we're actually discovering more and more. And it's also based on how much we can extract. And we're also actually developing techniques so we can extract more and more. And, of course, the price will increase if you're going to more exotic places. Right? So the Middle East is, has the cheapest oil. Uh, that's why um, Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, they are very rich in oil, but they're actually getting the oil out of the ground. For them, it's very cheap. That's their strength. And if we look for other stuff, for example, if we're going to uh, uh, deep sea or some other places, of course, it, it will increase the price. But it's still, we have the technology of doing that. And this slide, what it tells you is that we have enough oil for the next 100 years, for sure. Um, 
So I think this is related to um, locations of um, oil supply within uh, deep water. I don't remember how that, there is super deep deep water and EOR. I don't really remember how they. Uh, so Thank you. Uh, and WEO required to need to 2013. When this uh, was done, it was done based on how much energy we need and how much energy we will have to do more. And this is how much energy, or how much oil we will need to produce. So that's World Energy Organization. I think so, yes. So again, uh, I'll have to say that uh, there's a lot of uh, different research about these aspects. People say different things, but we know for sure the oil is not going to run out in the short term. Now, you can't say we do need solutions for 100 years because uh, we, hopefully humanity is going to survive the next 100 years. That's definitely true. Uh, in terms of global solutions, uh, countries, companies usually don't really look for solutions for another 100 years. Uh, so that's definitely, uh, I would say that the answer is not black and white. We do, we're going to run out of oil at some point or it's going to be very, very expensive. On the other hand, it's not going to happen in the, in the near term, or in the near future, at least. The second thing is about energy independence. Uh, this is actually before this bloom of the fracking. Uh, and the truth is that in, if total energy is looked at, US is over 70% uh, self-sufficient. In terms of oil production, oil production in the US peaked at, I think, the, towards the end of the 80s. Uh, then it slowly decreased, but now because of the fracking, it actually peaked again. And, and in 2014, there was actually more oil production than level in the back in the U.S. history. And the major suppliers are Canada, and that's really decreased because Canada is really based in on um, oil sand. Uh, then Saudi Arabia, 15%, Mexico, and Venezuela. So of course, the U.S. is not 100% energy independent, and we do want to aim for energy independence, but the situation is not as bad as we think we are. And the third thing that I want to briefly discuss is the uh, climate change. Um, I really like this picture because this picture, the, this glowing uh, line here, that's actually the atmosphere. And I think sometimes we tend to forget how thin the atmosphere is. The atmosphere is roughly 400 kilometers. Um, and we know today that the atmosphere uh, composition has changed. We know that humanity contributed to this change. We have the greenhouse gases. I really believe that uh, climate change is a topic for a full lecture. Uh, that's not my expertise. Um, I do think that global uh, warming is happening. One of my <coughs> favorite examples is that it's really nice uh, essay that they did uh, where they checked how much radical temperature you get during the summer. And usually, of course, you'll get some kind of like an average. Sometimes you'll have an extreme uh, warm day. Sometimes you'll have an extreme cold days. But we can see is that, uh, and again, it's nice to look on the scale. They did it for the past 60 years. Um, things have been shifting, and we get more radical warm days uh, than radical cold days. Again, there's uh, many different ways to check global warming. There's still many different ways to assess how much impact there is really, really is. Um, but a nice quote that I heard that I really like is that we will run out of atmosphere before we will run out of uh, for oil. Before we will run out of oil. So I will say that at least from uh, from my perspective, and I, I think it's important to say that all this lecture is based on my personal perspective, uh, is that the main reason that we should aim for alternative energy and for a more sustainable system is mainly climate change and the future of the of the globe. In a way, uh, we do need to take care of solutions, of more sustainable solutions, so we won't run out of fossil fuel. I mean, uh, 100 years at some point it's going to come. Uh, we do want to become more energy independent. There is some benefits for alternative energy in terms of economics, so it's all true. Uh, but for me, the most uh, important thing that we need to address right now in terms of energy is climate change. Uh, and it's definitely still true, uh, although there was dramatic changes in the past year with fracking. Fracking become a very uh, efficient technology, so we can extract much more oil and natural gas. Uh, and that's good because it reduces our uh, um, cost of energy, uh, but it doesn't solve the problem of uh, climate change. Okay, so 
I'll just say that again, the major, well, we all talk about this, the major reason is to try to reduce the greenhouse gases. I will say one thing that's uh, for me very important is that to emphasize the fact that there is not going to be one technology that's going to replace uh, fossil fuel. And I think that's important because I feel, at least from the field of alternative energy, that people present their solution and they present it in a way that, oh, that's the next big thing and that's what we should aim for. And I'm going to talk today about bioenergy, and in bioenergy I'm mainly going to talk about biofuel that is definitely not going to be the only solution for the future. It needs to be part of the solution. If you are a big fan of solar energy, that's great. We do need as much solar energy as possible. If you are a big fan of electric car, that's great. We do need as much electric car as possible. We do need as much biofuels as possible. We do need as much energy efficiency as possible. We do want to reduce our energy use. We need all of that. Remember this big box next to the Eiffel Tower? That's what we need to replace. And it's not going to happen with one technology. And again, that's important. I'm going to now move to trying to talk about more about biofuels and bioenergy. It's going to be part of the solution, not all of it. Okay, so now, uh, trying to uh, mix this water and oil. So the first part was a little bit about molecular biology and DNA sequencing. And then we shifted into uh, energy. So how... DNA sequencing, or in general, modern molecular biology, can actually contribute to, this to the era, uh, to the area, sorry, of uh, alternative energy. So first, again, I'm focusing on bioenergy. There's a lot of other alternative energy that we should use. Uh, today, when we talk about bioenergy, it's true that there is some biogas, the production of natural gas from uh, biological material, like biomass. I'm not going to talk about that, although that's, uh, that's actually has some benefits. Um, when we talk about bioenergy, we are mainly talking about biofuels. And when we're talking about biofuels, the problem is that there are many different types of biofuels. One of them is, for example, uh, bioethanol from sugarcane. In Brazil, 40% of their transportation fuel is actually coming from sugarcane. And the technology is relatively simple. You take a sugarcane, you squeeze it, you get a juice. If you dry the juice, you get the sugar that we use for coffee and tea, this white material. And you can use it for two things. You can use it for food. You can also use it for production of ethanol, of alcohol, or fuel. Relatively simple. You all know fermentation. That's how we get our alcohol in the wine and beer. Right? They add sugar. They add yeast. What the yeast does, it contain, it consumes, sorry, consume the sugar and produce ethanol. That's how we can. Uh, that's how we produce alcohol for our wine and beer. We can also. Uh, use it for energy or for uh, transportation. Just as an anecdote, the only reason Brazil got into this uh, biofuels in the uh, 50s, the end of the 40s, the 50s, Brazil was so poor that it just didn't have any money to buy oil. And uh, some people uh, suggested to the government, they say, well, we don't, we're so poor, we don't have money to buy oil, uh, but we do have a lot of sugar cane. And we can actually convert that into ethanol, and we can actually start to use that to uh, use it for transportation. So the only reason they got into this was just because their economic was so bad. Uh, they become extremely good in producing uh, sugar, and uh, later on they now doing a relatively good job in converting this sugar into um, fuel. And also, uh, it really helps their economy. Based on this uh, method, we all know here in the US we can use corn ethanol. And in corn ethanol, it's relatively similar. Uh, when you talk about corn kernels, what we actually eat, it's between 60 to 70 percent uh, starch. Starch is basically a very long chain of uh, glucose. And relatively easy, we can break this starch into sugar. And once we have this sugar, we can actually use the exactly same uh, process using fermentation and uh, producing ethanol. Today in the US, we use roughly 10% of our transportation fuel is based on corn ethanol. And corn ethanol and sugarcane, uh, although to a less degree, started this huge thing that calls food versus fuel. Uh, there are some experts here in Berkeley talking about, uh, I guess, doing research on this food versus fuel. Um, I would say as a plant biologist, definitely not as, a, an, as an expert. Uh, first of all, of course, that's not good. As a plant biology, we don't want to take plants that are used for food and now trying to convert them into fuel. Uh, intuitively, that doesn't seem the best idea. Uh, on the other hand, I will 
say that that's not as bad as people like to present it. Uh, at least today, uh, in the US, uh, the corn farmers or the corn growers, they will grow corn based on how much fuel they can actually produce out of it. And if they get permission for less fuel, they will grow less corn. So they don't grow as much corn as possible and then decide what to do with it. They know in advance what's going to go for food and what's going to do go for fuel. Uh, so again, there is some uh, there is much more complexity to this. They can actually try to sell these permissions and stuff like that. But again, as a as a biologist, as a plant biologist, we are not focusing on on this, which actually is already a very successful process. We want to try to move to the next generation of biofuels, and our concept is that we want to use plants produce energy, to produce fuel, but plants that won't compete with food crops. And that's basically the point of the next generation biofuels, also called second generation biofuels, also called lignocellulosic biofuels. Right? We want to just take plants that won't compete with food and convert them into ethanol. And the question is, how do we do it, or how can we actually think about doing that? Well, remember I told you in the beginning that when we look at the cell, all the cells are surrounded by the membrane, human and plant, but plants have this thick layer of cell wall. Right? And the cell wall is actually the woody material. When you look on wood, the most, the, the, basically what you see is actually the cell wall. And this is an electron microscope uh, of two cells, and you can see this thick layer. My personal research is trying to understand the genes that are responsible for the biosynthesis of these uh, polymers. And again, when we look on plants, every plant that you have in your garden, that you see in the street, every plant, the majority, actually more than 95% of its mass, is actually these layers of the cell wall. And what this cell wall is composed about? It's composed from cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin. Now, I'm not going to talk about the details of the chemical structures of these polymers, but it's relatively simple. Cellulose, basically, it's a sugar. Cellulose, in, say, actually, you all know, Cotton is cellulose. Our clothes are actually made out of uh, cellulose. I'll give you a great example about that. Right? On the other hand, we all know that if we try to eat our clothes, it's not going to really be tasty. Right? Definitely not sweet. <laughs> and it's funny, but it's true. And I'm also show you, going to show you an example about who can actually eat that. And the thing is that cotton or cellulose, or again, this material, or the wood that you look around you, it's true. It's mainly sugar. It's roughly 80% sugar. But this sugar is in a structure, in a, such a crystal structure, that we can actually cannot break it. That's the problem. If you're going to try to eat your shirt or wood, the only reason you won't get energy out of it is because you don't have the mechanism to break it into the molecule, the single molecule of sugar that your body can actually use. All right? For example, cows can do it, and we're going to talk about cows. But when, we, when you look about plants, I guess, as a plant biology that's working on cell wall, my point is that when you look on plants, 80% of what you're seeing is actually sugar. The only thing is that it's not accessible to you. And what we want in terms of developing alternative energy is to develop a system that will allow us to break this into individual sugars and therefore convert it into um, ethanol or whatever other alcohol that we'll use for fuel. Right? So cellulose, that's cotton, that's uh, the main polymer, uh, that's sugar. Hemicellulose is actually, a again, a network of sugars. Um, a little bit more complex, that's usually the leftover of plants, therefore it's mainly used in animal feed. Again, it's all sugar. Then we have lignin. Lignin is actually the brown material that gives the plants or the plant their brown color. These two are white, this is brown. Uh, and for example, when you see a table which is dark brown, that's actually because it contains a lot of lignin, a lot of this woody material. When you see furnitures that are much more light, that's because they extracted this uh, woody material. There will be also no wood. Um, for example, papers uh, that we used to write, that's actually a woody material that just extracted the lignin, so you'll get this white, nice uh, uh, paper. All right, so a big question in bioenergy now is where? Because as I mentioned, the most important thing for us is to develop plants that won't compete with food crops. So, a great example is the energy crops that we can grow in the Midwest where regions that are the soil is so poor that you cannot grow any other crop plants like corn and, and wheat and stuff like that. Uh, the advantage of these uh, energy crops is that they are relatively in a very low need for nutrients, so we can actually grow them in this poor soil. Uh, 
A uh, very attractive place, of course, is arid lands. Uh, the problem is there, you definitely don't compete with food. The problem is that of our productivity. In a way, and that's our big challenge, and that's why it's taking so long, so long we need to develop a new type of agriculture, plants that we haven't used before. Um, again, as a plant biology, I, I'll, I can ask you, if you think about how many plants you actually eat or use, I, I can guarantee that it's going to be very hard for you to count more than 50. And out of these 50, we're actually using mainly four for our nutrition, and the others are kind of like exotic. Kiwis are great, but we don't use them a lot. We mainly use wheat, we mainly use corn, we mainly use rice. Right? So it's very hard to do, uh, develop this new type of agriculture. And again, uh, it's all about the scale. So this is an example from Iowa. There's a factory that's actually trying to develop this next generation uh, biofuels. Uh, from corn stover. So this is the leftover of corn. They collect the leftover of corns. And the leftover of corns, like your plants in the garden, is mainly sugar, but very hard to extract. And they try to break it and convert it into ethanol. They are managed to produce 100 million liters of ethanol per year. That sounds great, but it's actually a small scale compared to what we need. And that's a 10 day supply. And you can see here the crack. Right? So the scale is something that's very challenging. It's very easy for us, and I, I'll say as a basic research, I guess, it's very easy for us to do stuff on the bench in the lab. It's much more difficult to do it in the field. Yes? That's a 10-day supply for what? For the whole world? No, no, no. 10 day supplies to get 100 million liter of ethanol per year. Oh. oh okay. That's what they use. That's how long they took to make it. No, no, no. Every 10 days, they will use that to convert into ethanol, and eventually they will be able to produce 100 million liters per year. Right? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'll just repeat the question. The question was, what exactly do we mean by 10 day supply? So the factory used this amount of leftover corn every 10 days in order to produce 100 million liters per year. So again, there is a big, uh, the, the, the big problem, of course, is the scale. So now, how do we can use this uh, molecular biology to assist this type of problems? And I want to start with Moore Law, which I'm sure most of you know about it. Moore was the CEO of Intel, and I think it's in the 70s or a little bit before, he started the Moore Law. And the Moore Law was that the computer, uh, computational power is going to double every two years. I think, I'm not a computational uh, person, so if I'm making small mistakes, I <coughs> don't uh, be angry, I guess. But that's, th that's roughly the moral law. And the amazing thing with the moral law is that companies starting to develop stuff for computers based on moral law. They knew that in two years, computational power is going to double, and they develop software, hardware based on this thing. And what moral law, but basically just double the transistors, uh, on our chip, and the big thing was actually how to condense it. Relatively recently, Moore actually announced that the law is not more valid because we cannot condense it more and more and more, so it, it stopped at some point. But the reason I want to talk about it because think how much computer has been developed from the 70s. Right? And from the 80s, today all of us have smartphones. We can do incredible things with the smartphones that we didn't even thought about doing 50 years ago. And this is more law here in line, and this is the cost for DNA sequencing. Right? So back in 2000, and that's the price to sequence one millionth letter of DNA. Right? Back in 2000, I started my undergrad in 2000. It cost you $10,000 to get 1,000 letters of DNA. And it slowly developed, developed, developed. I'm not going to talk about exactly what changed. There was a huge break in DNA sequencing about new technology. And the price started to go down. And today, with one cent, or so, uh, uh, yeah, with, with, uh, with ten cents, with one dime, you can sequence the one million letters of DNA. Right? That's the price, and it's going down a little bit lower. Actually, what they're working now is to get the data much faster. It takes two weeks to sequence your genome. Will cost eight thousand dollars, and it will take two weeks. In two thousand. It took two years and it cost us more than $100 million, right, roughly. 
And it's, it's something that we, it's, we use on a daily basis. In my research for the past five years, I sequenced 12 genomes. And it was fast, it was super cheap, uh, the plants I'm working on, it was $800 to get the entire genome. And actually in 100x coverage. So for each letter, I got it for 100 times the same letter just to make sure that I'm getting the right letter. All right? So the price of DNA sequencing has become so low that it's now become more and more available to us. And I will talk only about plant biology, but I would say as a, I don't know, as a human being, that's also going to have a dramatic change on all aspects of our life. Uh, it's mainly now being driven by, of course, uh, biomedical research. And I can guarantee you that in 30 years, most of us will have our DNA sequenced. Why? I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> seriously. How this data will be translated, I'm also not sure. Uh, how reliable the people that sequence your DNA will tell you stuff about yourself, I'm not sure, but it's going to happen. Why? Because it's available. We all have smartphones. Do we really need them all the time? No, but we have them and it's really fun. And it's going to happen the same with DNA sequence. And some stuff we can actually uh, reliably say, some stuff we don't. I'll give you just one example. Again, I'm a plant biologist, that's really not my field, but there's one, uh, one example. There was one research that they took 500 people that used their left hand uh, and they sequenced their genome. They want to understand what's the difference of why people use their left hand. And they found, they found one gene that was uh, mut mutagenized in all of these 500 people. And we're like, woohoo, we found, we found the reason why people use their left hand. And this gene encodes a protein that transports sugar in the kidney. Now how that the hell relates to bills in your left hand? We have no idea. <laughs> Nothing. But there is a correlation. If you have a mutation in this gene, you're probably going to use your left hand. Do we really understand it? No. But we can tell you if you're going to use your left hand or not. All right? So there's going to be dramatic changes. It's in, on a serious side now, it's going to happen. It becomes more and more cheap. The NIH goal is to sequence a human genome in $1,000. I will say, I guess as a foreign, I, I, I came here five years ago, uh, US is doing an incredibly good job in science and in research, and if the NIH announced this uh, goal, it's gonna happen. Uh, there's go we're gonna have our DNA sequence in $1,000. And $1,000 is something that we are relatively can afford ourselves. <coughs> Definitely, because it's so interesting to get our DNA, right? So, now the question is, how can we use this information, right? And I want to start by telling you uh, a little story about what happened in the Second World War. Second World War, the, uh, the U.S. had a, a soldiers in Europe, um, and the soldiers had a problem. Their tent used to break down every three weeks. And with the European weather, uh, winter, it's not that fun, right? So the, the soldiers start to complain and said, you're sending us tents that getting degraded every three weeks. Every three weeks, we need a new tent. Right. So the U.S. sent a, a bunch of uh, scientists try to understand why the, the tents are okay, being degraded. Actually, a uh, big part of the scientists were coming up from here, from Berkeley. And what they found is that the tents are building up from canvas. And canvas is cellulose. Remember cellulose, the big uh, main molecules in the plant cell wall? That's actually canvas. And there is a fungi that can actually eat this cellulose, and use it as a source for sugar, because as I mentioned, cellulose, our cotton, canvas, paper, it's only glucose, it's only sugar. We cannot use it because we don't know how to break it. This fungi does know how to grow on it, know how to break it into sugar, and can grow. So they brought it back, again, they brought it, a part of it was, big part of it was here in Berkeley. And slowly, with modern biology, at the beginning it was like, okay, so we have a fungi that uh, can, can break cellulose. But slowly with modern biology, we understand the DNA, we understand protein, we realize how does it actually do it. And it does it using enzymes, and enzymes are proteins that have a specific function, and we know the DNA sequence, and we can later on, I show you how DNA will translate into amino acids, how it will translate into protein, and we have this protein, and what this protein does this is actually, you can think about it as your shirt, because this is cellulose. Oh, sorry, shirt. And what this protein enzyme does, it runs over the fibers and cleave it and cut the glucose 
allodene. And release glucose. And the glucose, the fungi, like you, like me, can use it as a source for energy. So they developed it. They developed this type of uh, fungi. And we use it on a daily basis in a thing that you won't even believe. For example, to use for genes. So I'm sure you all saw this type of genes. I think it's called stonewash. And we always think, and that's the way it was done, that they used to fold the genes and stain it. And the parts that were folded were not getting stained, so you get this nice, cool-looking genes. Right? I'm sorry, now I, I, I found myself so nerdy, but I'll, I'll just go on. So anyway, how do they do it today? Today, they actually, what they do, because it became so cheap to work with enzymes, is that they actually take the genes, they stain all of it in one color, and then they release these enzymes on specific parts. Now, what these enzymes will do, they will actually eat the first layer of cellulose, of this plant, or the, the cotton, and will release or will cleave and degrade all the, the first layer that was stained and will release the layer below it that was not stained. And that's why we get the white color, which was actually the original uh, color of the fiber. Right? So that's for one example that how we use enzymes today. And another thing that we can do, and that was really, um, again, Berkeley was, Berkeley was actually a big part of it, is that now we can start to ask other questions. And I'm not saying that that's not important. It's an industry and that's important. But we can start asking some other questions. For example, we can start to ask, well, now that we know how to sequence DNA, that we understand what genetic information means, what does it mean that the cow eat the grass? How does it actually do it? How does it use the plant to get the energy out of it and why can't we? And what they did is they actually dig a hole into the cow, and apparently the cow can live. As a plant biology, I hate this kind of stuff, that's why I'm sticking into plant, but you can actually do it. And you can start going into the uh, cow woman and start sequence DNA and ask, well, what's really there that helps the cow to actually eat the grass, right? Because as I said, grass, the plants in your garden, this thing, they're all made out of sugar. How does the cow actually break it? It actually, it's not the cow. The cow has a tons of microorganisms, mainly bacteria, in the woman that they are the ones that actually know how to do it. We sequenced the DNA coming out from the gut woman, and we found genes that are responsible, like this enzyme, that's called cellulase, by the way, enzymes that are responsible of breaking biomass into sugar. Right? They're actually in the cow, in the, sorry, in the cow uh, woman, there's 27,000 genes like that, coming out from, I think, more than 5,000 different uh, bacteria. And actually, now we have the opposite problem, how the hell we know which one is important and which one is not. Right? But it was allowed based on this um, fact that DNA sequencing is so cheap. So we can start to do more and more experiments like that. And we can start to ask questions, well, what do we really need in order to break the biomass? Um, and that's one relatively um, successful ex uh, uh, example because we were able to identify several genes, meaning proteins that are responsible for biomass degradation. We can use them, try to break down the biomass into sugars. Um, and we can also, now that we have the ability to look at DNA, we can actually modify them and make them more efficient or more to our purpose. And the last slide I want to uh, uh, present is about more about, I'm sorry, uh, more about plant biology. And as we can do this using DNA sequencing to understand more about how cow uh, breaks down the biomass into sugar, we can also use this DNA sequencing to understand how plants actually uh, live or grow. And what exactly do we need, what we can change, um, and how can we actually use our knowledge for if we want it for agriculture. For example, you know now what limits actually the production of uh, better uh, wheat strains. The problem is every time we get a better uh, wheat strain, meaning uh, wheat that has more grains on it, it just breaks apart. The, uh, the straw is not strong enough to actually hold the barrier of the grains. And we now use DNA sequencing, we understand why is it happening. It's happening because of the cell wall is not strong enough. So we're actually now not looking to produce wheat with more grain, we want to produce wheat with a better cell wall that will be more resistant, that can carry on this uh, wheat, so we'll get more production per acre, right? Then there's a different problem, is that it's much more difficult for the combine to actually harvest it, so obviously nothing is simple, but we do, we can address the specific questions that we, that we want to ask. Um, on the other
other hand, from a bioenergy point of view, we can try to ask the question, what makes the plants, the cellulose, so uh, reluctant for degradation, and how we can actually address uh, um, these questions, make it maybe a little bit simpler for the bioenergy field. And the last thing I will say, again, from coming from a plant biology, uh, there is a lot of information out there in the web. Uh, it's very hard to uh, really understand what is reliable and what is not. Uh, luckily, you are all in the surrounding area of Berkeley. Most of the people here are, uh, will be happy to discuss with you. Uh, there's not necessarily a black and white answer, uh, but I think it's very important that we we'll start move on to some things that are um, based on knowledge rather than all kind of like uh, weird assumptions. In plant biology and bioenergy, and as I mentioned, I will be happy to answer any questions. I will also be happy to be available if you want to email me. And if you have any more questions, uh, I'll be happy to take them. So thank you. Thank you. So when the fungi actually break down the biomass, it actually uh, stores the carbon as, as, a, as a biomass for the fungi itself. And there's a lot of a, a really uh, tight connection between fungi grow and plants grow. And sometimes while the, the, when, the, when the fungi ends its life cycle, the plants can actually use this carbon. So I guess in the long term, that's not what's contributing to releasing of uh, carbon into the atmosphere. Um, is that Sorry, if we can go on If we could get the biomass to go underground again like it used to be. You know, ah, yeah, but that's uh, definitely there's no way that we can uh, be able to do it. Yeah. Yes, um, a lot of this was involved with the production of ethanol to be used as fuel. A lot more of the byproducts of burning ethanol. Mm. So, uh, that's a simple question with a complicated answer. So the way it works today is, as I mentioned, the biomass is composed, we can think about it two different things. One is the sugar and the other is the lignin. Uh, what they actually do today is they burn the lignin. Uh, just then you get just based electricity based on uh, uh, this giant thermal converter. And that's the one that used to actually run the, the factory. Uh, this is slowly phasing out. Uh, that's relatively clean energy, but not as clean as we wanted. Um, there's definitely a big issue of byproducts, because uh, in the oil uh, industry, actually the more than 50% of their profit are not coming from fuel or gasoline, they're actually coming from byproducts, like the Coca-Cola bottles. Um, so we do think what we can do with all of the leftovers uh, in terms of more biodegradable material. Um, that's uh, definitely a very promising area that turns out to be also very difficult. Um, so um, we are trying to see how we can, beside producing fuel, what other byproducts we can make out of it um, that can compete with the byproducts we get in the fossil fuel. Of uh, course, if you, if you burn any of these organic matters, you, you're basically re going to release a carbon dioxide and water vapor into the atmosphere. Uh, uh, but also, we're talking about the fungi um, uh, uh, decaying the plant matter. Uh, the, the fungi must uh, 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 require a certain amount of energy, and it, would, it must release some as carbon dioxide and water vapor uh, as the byproduct of its energy extraction. But you're saying that it, it does store a lot of the uh, carbon mass in, in, in the fungi body itself. Yeah, so I will say, I think I, I uh, overlooked that. So the, the, the basic point of uh, energy-driven 
by biomass is that you start by the biomass actually harvest uh, the energy from the sun. And when it does, it's also the, the, the use to convert the energy from the sun into chemical energy, it's actually um, uh, store carbon, and carbon dioxide actually, right? So the basic uh, uh, equation of photosynthesis is light plus CO2 equals, uh, and, and plus water equals sugar uh, plus oxygen. Right, so when you start with that, you start by actually um, uh, carbon sequestration in a way. So then when you do the life cycle analysis, when you say I'm, play, I'm growing plant that will sequence carbon, and eventually, of course, I'm going to release it. When I'm selling ethanol for car transportation, of course, I'm releasing uh, CO2. I won't say that the life cycle is zero. Some people claim that the life cycle is zero. That's very optimistic. I would say that the pessimistic um, claim that we're reducing it by 60%. So we are still reducing our carbon emissions. Definitely not to zero. Uh, I won't say definitely not to zero. Probably not to zero. If it's very close to zero uh, or not, that's a different question. But we are reducing dramatically the carbon sequestration uh, without taking in account all of the different question. I don't know the answer. Uh, enzyme biology is not really my field. Um, it seems like, in a way, a little bit as an outsider, it seems to me today that they are really focusing on uh, converting these cellulases to have more properties that will fit the current process. Uh, and even that seems to be challenging. For example, these enzymes need to be much more uh, thermal um, uh, resistance because they, they want the process to run in high temperature and this, the problem with these proteins that will be great. They want to recycle their activity. So it seems to me that they are focusing more on this aspect. Uh, that what you just said is a beautiful idea. I, I don't know if they're actually the same. I'm, I'm sorry. That's an excellent question. So again, not in my field, so I will say it uh, again, uh, not as an expert, uh, but there was a lot of research done on how much CO2 you actually emit in a total life cycle. So again, when you're looking on uh, bioethanol from either sugarcane or from corn, you still need to take in account that you grow a sugarcane on a corn and they absorb the CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, Again, it, as far as I know, I'm sure there will be people that will tell you differently. Uh, and I'm not in a position that I know what's reliable or not. What seems to me reliable, they say that um, corn ethanol is actually, in a way, a little bit equivalent to uh, gasoline from oil. Uh, there's not a lot of reduction. Um, sugar cane ethanol, it does. There is actually a major reduction. That's why it, con it uh, consists or it's uh, taking account as advanced biofuel. Uh, the DOE consider uh, biofuels from sugarcane as advanced biofuel because they claim there is a 50% reduction in the CO2 emissions. Um, that's why it's illegal to import biofuels from uh, Brazil. Uh, in lignocellulosic uh, biofuel, I would say two things. One, again, more and more research seems that it will be very close to zero. Uh, I will say that we don't have the scale as they have in, in uh, sugarcane as in corn. So uh, it's of course, it's working maybe to our favor, but it seems to be, again, when you're growing the biomass, you harvest a lot of this CO2. Uh, and in the global life cycle, at least in the lignocellulosic biofuel, it seems that it's going to be a big reduction compared to gasoline. So uh, that's definitely uh, in the one of the goal uh, to make more drop-in fuels. Um, it seems to be now that there's kind of like two area working uh, on the same thing uh, at the same time. 
One of them is first, how do we get as much sugar possible out of the plants? Because it seems, well, in terms of plant biology, the major carbon that's the, once the plant has harvested the light energy into, uh, it's actually going into sucrose, which uh, is glucose and fructose, what these two uh, sugar molecules will immediately go is actually into the cell wall. That's the plant body. And it doesn't seem that you can play a lot with that. Any try to uh, play with that will basically just damage the plant's uh, life. So we know that the majority of the binary mass will still be uh, composed out of sugar. So one area is how do we release, how do we break down this biomass into the monomer sugars? The second thing is how do we convert these sugars into energy? And it, I would say that definitely ethanol is not the first priority. Actually, butanol is much better than ethanol. Um, on the other hand, the advantage of ethanol is that we have been developed ways to convert sugars into ethanol for much longer time, rather to, to other uh, alcohol or any other type of molecules. So there is still some advantage of going into ethanol. Uh, not necessarily means that that's a good one. Yes. So that, that, that's actually something California uh, had a lot of effort in it, uh, trying to convert uh, municipal waste into uh, energy. It's definitely true that um, we still like simple systems. We like to get one plant that we know the composition, and when you take uh, basically just garden waste, then everyone has different uh, plants in their garden, and they do change a little bit. So you get much more variability, and it's much more difficult to develop a process that will accumulate all of these variabilities in what you're getting. Uh, there is a lot of potential uh, in these aspects of uh, municipal waste. Uh, you can convert it into biogas, for example, that's going to be simpler, although it's not as efficient as uh, converting it to uh, ethanol uh, or even cellulosic fuel. Um, the advantage is that it's being harvested and being collected in any case, right? Uh, that's a big thing in, in this aspect. Uh, there's another issue of how much you want to separate the, this waste. Uh, it's something that actually is being taken into account, especially here in California. Um, there is the potential, I think, the numbers that California did is that it can, uh, it can pay something like 15%, 15.15% of California energy needs uh, if we will convert it. Um, the, of course, the problem is the cost. Uh, we, so I would say, again, that it seems like now, the way the future of the field looks like, again, I'm, I'm not that expert in the field, but um, developing the process is much more <coughs> difficult than uh, what people, I guess, thought or was presented to the public. It seems like that the process will be developed on relatively simple biomass, like corn stover, the leftover of corn, or like sugarcane bagage, because of two things. One, in any case, we produce a lot of them, so that they are relatively available and they are relatively homogeneous. When you get corn stover, you know what you get. When you get municipal uh, waste, it really depends on the state, it depends on the time of the year, so the process should be much more flexible, therefore much more complicated. What about the ag sector, or the forestry sector? The sawmill waste, for instance, uh, there's a significant amount of that, which is very high in lignin, I guess, but it's um, concentrated in one area, So at least it seems now is that agri residues are a great source uh, for biofuels. It doesn't necessarily meet the scale that uh, they want. So even if you talk about corn stover, so the thing with corn, once you harvest the corn, the corn leftovers are needs to be left in the field to keep the moisture of the ground. You know, they found that you can actually take only 50% of this uh, corn stover. 
And then if you start to do all the calculation, which is of course not my uh, area, then you realize that it is going to work, but in relatively small scale. If you really want to replace the goal of biofuel, by the way, of lignocellulosic biofuel, is to replace 20% of our oil consumption. So if you think about that, you do want something that is more specialized and it's going to give better yield than ag residues. But I think that ag residues are going to be the one that we're going to base our technology because they are already existing and because, and because we can characterize them very well. Someone did that. Switchgrass is one of the uh, bioenergy crops that we think about. Uh, the advantage of switchgrass is that it's relatively resistant to cold. Uh, so big parts in the east, we can actually think that are very poor in soil and uh, we don't grow anything there, we can think about growing uh, switchgrass. Uh, that's, that's one of what we call bioenergy crop. Just a question. Uh, I'll be able to stay and ask questions. one thing. So first of all, hydrogen definitely needs to be part of our, element, our future, for sure. Uh, we are using it now, today. The only problem with hydrogen is it's very, very expensive to condense. And therefore, you can put it in uh, private vehicles, not even in SUVs, or these jeeps that we're using. It's great for trucks, it's great for buses, because then you have less problem of uh, space. In your personal car, you won't be able to condense the hydrogen uh, to fit into your uh, that's something, uh, there is you some issues. Well, what? You can cool it, and that will condense a lot more. It's too much energy. But then it's not efficient. It's uh, all the companies have looked at it, and it seems like it's going to catch, and it's going to catch, but in the heavy duty sector, like trucks and buses, not in the personal cars. But it definitely needs to be part of our So I I'm still here. If you have any questions, thank you very much.